I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. All right, Lee. Let's do this. It's round okay. three. This is number three in our 10-part series, 100 Years of Chinese Literature, the greatest writers. The definitive works from each decade. Definitive 20th, writers from each the, decade. In the 20th century, right? Yes. Yes. So, we thought about going all the way to the present, but 120 doesn't have quite the ring 100 does. I mean, it... Maybe if the people demand it. If, if, if we have a command performance, we're not going to turn down a curtain call, especially if it involves money, you know, which I'm sure it will. We're, we're rapidly on our way to fame and fortune now that we're starting to promote this a little more. So, Rob, for Yo. the years 1900 to 1909, I chose Wu Jinren. You chose Wang Go Away. Um, from 1910 to 1919, I chose Lu Xun. You chose... Li Da Zhao. Li Da Zhao. And, we, and, and I, sh- I should remind the listener... We also had a mini debate about the greatest mustache in the history of Chinese literature. And early true. on, we were agreed that that belonged to Lu Xun. Scrolling, the, 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 the Chinese literature podcast research team pulled up another picture of Li Da Zhao, and we had to give the victory to Li Da Zhao, who has by far the most impressive mustache from that era. Today, we will not be having any mustache competitions. No mustache competitions, no. We are looking at the 1920s, so the yes. years 1920 to 1929. And let's set everybody up historically here. So we've got the Qing Dynasty Falls. 1911, 1912, yeah. depending Warlords on Warlords how- take over. There's a brief period. Uh, some people will say the Republic begins in 1912, but in actuality, it's mostly a period of division for about 15 years from right. 1912 to 1925 the communist party comes into being in the early 19, parts of the 1920s yeah that's july 1921 right and then but it doesn't thrive for very long because uh jiang jie who that's chiang kai-shek chiang kai-shek eventually comes out on top uh with his military force and becomes the de facto government he does not like communists. He, he says communism is a disease of the heart. Yes, Lee would agree, but that's for a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, pushes them out. The Long March will become about, the Mao's famous Long March will come about as a result of him purging Shanghai and eventually as many other cities as he can get of communists. So I don't think we need to go too deep into nope. the history, but it's important to know that there are a lot of moving parts. Yes. You have a, the Republic of China is during the 1920s sort of stabilizing. And as a part of that stabilization, communism is pushed to the back burner. It goes, it, it escapes alive, but yes. just barely to some of the more rural parts of China. So I think the, 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 the thing I wanted to get across before we get into our, our writers here is that this is a period when the, the flush of excitement from toppling the final dynasty and this sort of thrill of where are we going next has started to fade and we're starting to recede into some familiar patterns. So you have an emperor figure, which is effectively who Chiang Kai-shek is, right? He's got all the guns. He's got the charisma to make people do what he wants. And that's how it is, right? The emperor. I, I think it's probably better to just think of him as a warlord, which is another true. important uh, also figure true. in in Chinese history. Yeah. So this is a turbulent period. You could argue every decade in the 20th century in China was turbulent. Uh, this one particularly, this, though, because... You have this first flush, especially of intellectuals and writers who are participating in what they hoped would be this great reform, are now starting to look around and go, something is is awry, something is not working. Either maybe it's us, maybe it's society, I don't know. The May 4th movement starts in 1919, but it really continues on into the early 1920s. And that is one of the main forces that are driving... Uh, kind of intellectual history in China at this period. Rob, let's get down to our two writers who are both, I would say, May 4th figures. Um, They both come out of the May 4th movement, uh, but in very different ways. So last time I chose Lu Xun. This time I'm choosing Lu Xun. So Rob, you're saying Lu Xun is more of a 1920s figure. That is what I'm saying. Uh, As I argued last time, Lu Xun is pretty much out of commission for most of 19... 10 to 1919 uh he's going from teaching post to teaching post he's working mostly as a secretary copying books for part of this time translating and that as well 
he's burned down on stuff so much that he effectively has to be talked into writing anything again, which is part of the famous preface to his 1921 collection, War Cry, Nahan. Um, anyway, he does publish two epochal stories in that period, but the 1920s... He, he publishes two very important stories in the in the year 1918 and 1919. Right. Years 1918 right. and 1919. But Lu Xun, as the figure we know today, the, the one who exerts the greatest influence in the culture, is the one in the 1920s. We have the full collection of his early works, Nahan, published in the early 20s, 21, 22, depending on how you're dating it. Um, but the main reason I'm choosing him for this decade is for a couple of things. One, we know Diary of a Madman, the true story of IQ. Those are the canonical works. And those are both published in the 19... 19- yes, not before 1920. Before 1920. Right. But if you read the rest of War Cry, there's an incredible amount of variety. There's what seems to be autobiography, although who actually knows for sure. There is at least one piece that is essentially supernatural called White Light, my favorite story in the collection, about a guy following this mysterious ball of light. Um... There's obviously Diary of a Madman, things like that. He's all over the map stylistically, very experimental, uh, far more interesting than later sort of commentators grant him. But And so, you know, to some extent, then he's all in, right? Literature is going to change the world, and I'm a part of it. Let's do this, right? But he burns out. Uh, he keeps trying to secure positions. He has, he's in a very, not even an unhappy marriage, he's in a non-marriage, basically, has an affair with one of his students, ends up living with her. Um, in the mid in the mid twenties, he begins work on and eventually publishes in nineteen twenty seven a work which, in an earlier podcast, I have called my single favorite work of Chinese literature, which is Wild Grass. Yeah, it's all. Um, partly because it's so strange and experimental, very well written as well. It's essentially a very that's a collection of, of prose poetry, and I don't even know if I could describe it in a few words because it's all over the map. It's very trippy. It's very trippy, extremely trippy. Uh, in several cases, there's a speaker dreaming about a speaker dreaming about a speaker, and we don't even know where we are anymore. Um, but it's, all of that— It's uh, Wild Grass is an appropriate name for it. It is. In a it absolutely is. Ways. <laughs> it is. Well, I mean, it really is, though. Like, things growing up haphazardly, they're not trimmed. Who knows what, where they are, where they're going— the, and the reason I say that this for me is is the the crucial trajectory for an intellectual, not just in the 20s, but in the 20th century in China, is because Lu Xun can never fully move away from uh, ancient China, the classics. Uh, there's even one or two poems in Wild Grass that are written in, in a classical meter, right? He can't leave it behind, but he also can't fully em- embrace it, right? And the same with, with all sides, with communism, with modern China, with European fiction. He can never fully go in any camp. And so he finds himself trying to commit to something, burning out on it, moving to something else, burning out on that. And Wild Grass, for me, is the ultimate record of a struggle like that. What does it even mean to be Chinese in this era? I, I don't even know. And that's the, the, the answer is not the following things. It's I don't know. It's 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 hard. It's a contradiction. Is there even such a thing? I don't I don't even have an answer to that. And so you have this revolutionary figure who within 6 years is publishing something that you could never use for any revolution anywhere. So Lee, you've already done your Lucian thing. Let's hear who your writer is for the 20s. My writer is Dingling. Dingling Who incidentally, I have no problem with as a choice. I went with Lucian, but uh, fair enough. Uh, Dingling is one of the most important female writers in the 20th Absolutely. century Chinese tradition. Uh, she is on. She is a part of the the sort of left wing writers, and she is a fascinating figure. Absolutely, she lives into the 1980s. And I forgot that. You're yeah, right. You're right. She's incredible because in the 1920s she's writing about. I, essentially, her her question is is what happens to Nora? You know, Lu Xun poses the question: What happens to Nora in a Chinese context? Nora being who? Nora, sorry, uh, Nora being uh, this is the character from Heinrich Ibsen's famous play, uh, The Dollhouse, right? Um, which was translated into Chinese and became a huge, 
very important play in the 1910s, 1920s. Um, and Dingling is responding to that. She's pushing back against these male May 4th intellectuals like Lu Xun and asking, what role does gender play mm. in this? So Lu Xun has his famous story um, called uh, Homecoming, Gu Zhang. Mm. And, or I guess it's translated as my old home, oftentimes in English. Uh, but in this story, the the female figure is kind of without agency. And in Dingling stories, Dingling sort of writes against the the sense that males are the only ones who can be intellectuals. Males right. are the ones who have agency. Uh, her most famous early story is Sophie's Diary, which is uh, sort of fascinating both for what it says about gender and also the kind of psychology that's going on. It is this, I mean, it's a diary of a woman who is trying to decide between two different men. They're you may see some symbolic value, but there's one who's more of a traditional Chinese guy and then another one who's a, a Chinese Hua Chao, a Chinese immigrant to Singapore, if I remember correctly, mm. uh, who's come back and is is trying to woo her. Uh, and she is she's the 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 main character Sophie is deciding between these two and she's dealing with all of these concepts uh, about gender and about modern life that are coming from the west and it's a just a really fascinating story i think that's her most influential work that's really the work Sophie's diary is the work that really sets her uh, her her trajectory. She turns and she actually she she marries a guy, um, and in the mid nineteen thirties or early nineteen thirties, I believe, uh, he is captured and murdered by the KMT. He was they were both communists. Dingling and her husband uh, were both communists. Dingling is also imprisoned for a while by the KMT, but the the prison that she ha or the imprisonment is actually. Not that bad. Um, I mean, her freedom is restricted, but she's allowed to read a bunch. She actually revises Miss Sophie's diary uh, during her imprisonment. Now we're kind of getting into the 1930s, but because we're, you know, it's tingling, I think right. it's okay. Um, and then she eventually esca escapes uh, from imprisonment or she leaves imprisonment and she travels to Yan'an to be with the communist. She becomes this really fascinating figure. She actually is this leftist, but she's questioning how gender works in the Communist Party. She essentially accuses Mao and other communist leaders of of judging women by a uh, another standard, whereas men are judged from their political ideas, women's political ideals in women's political ideas in the Communist Party are judged based on who they're sleeping with. After 1942, Dingling becomes this very much a cowed figure, a cowed writer. Um, she's kind of pushed around and she never really sticks up for her, the ideals that she originally had. She, like I said, lives on into the 1980s, mm. um, but she's imprisoned in, soli in solitary confinement for a while during the Cultural Revolution also, she, you know, is sent off. She's exiled, essentially, to the far north. Um, all of this bad stuff happens to her, and she's still quite defensively protective right. of the socialist state throughout the rest of her life. What's is interesting, because both, um, both the May 4th movement and then the Communist Party that came after it don't arguably have a a lot of space for women. Um, Ding Ling is, let's see, I'm trying to get my, my names right. I don't want to do something stupid here. Perish the thought. Um, Too late. I know. We have other podcasts that demonstrate that the damage is already done. But Ding Ling, so far as I know, is the only woman writer working in the 20s among these other, it was a predominantly boys club, entirely boys club, who's, who's really holding her ground right um 
I think there may have been a few others. There may have been a few others. It's fairly but, a small. A but small she's group. she's one of the, the the ones to really contribute something that the men are not. Well, it, I say that as though the men are doing everything, the women aren't doing anything. They're they're being selectively. I, I won't say selectively and consciously edited out, but a lot of Dingling's writings demonstrate that. Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a perspective that you're missing here for all of your sort of national rhetoric. I would say that Dingling is not only uh, the the most persuasive writer who's asking this question about what is the role of women in, as China tries to modernize. I would also say that she is an author who deserves to not just be read as a women's author. Yeah. I don't think it's fair to categorize her. Just saying, hey, we're going to have a gender studies curriculum. Let's put in Dingling is not, Yeah, no, you she, can put Dingling in anywhere. She is one of those writers who can go toe to toe with Lu Xun. I don't know if she would come out winning in that, but she deserves to be treated like, I mean, she deserves to be in that uh, panoply of great make Agreed, but I, I think the, the reason that I go with Lu Xun over, over Dingling and particularly for the work Wild Grass, is because Lu Xun attempts to occupy a lot of different positions at the same time. And largely, I would argue, either fails or believes he fails in all of them. Yet Sao is a record of, one of the reasons it's called Wild Grass is because it's a space where anything is allowed to happen, right? Um, we should point out that Wild um, like wild Field is mm -hmm. actually the the sort of like a reference in China to to those outside of power. Right. So right. there is the sense that anyone anyone underprivileged and unlike a lot of issue writing where the underprivileged or whatever are depicted in this very dogmatic fairly unidimensional way, Lucian pulls way back um and gives you altered states of consciousness uh dream sequences reflections where it seems like he himself is sitting by a window but maybe it's not actually him and anyway it's it's trippy like you said earlier but one of the reasons it is trippy is because if what you're trying to do is describe a perspective where anyone anywhere who simply doesn't know who they are or where they're going has a space it has to be that way and the fact that the person who wrote the true story of Aq wrote this. Actually, I say that as though they're 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 totally contradictory, but they're really not in some ways because although there's been a lot of writing done about the the person, the character of Aq, this sort of buffoonish village idiot character, um, when you read the story, he's actually quite difficult to pin down. Like, is he the way he is because traditional society has made him that way? Are we supposed to laugh at him? Are we supposed to cry? I mean, famously. Lucian mentioned that he oftentimes had people come up to him and say, you based the character of IQ on me. Why did you do that? And he, he, he just repeatedly said, no, I, I, I based this, you know, on, I didn't base this on you, but everybody reads IQ as an insult to themselves right. during this period. And that's one of the reasons why that figure is sort of held up as the, the sort of the Chinese everyman, right? Um, well, not in a good way. Not in a good way. Not in a good way. But again, it would be easy to write a really black and white, here's this guy who was schooled in the Confucian classics, but he's an idiot, you know? Um, Zheng Pu's story, uh, Flowers in a Sea of Sin, Retribution, Yeah, Hai Hua, has a character kind of like that. This this Chinese scholar who's sent as a, 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 not really an ambassador, a diplomat, I guess, to Russia. Um, but he, he lives in his little commentary world and is constantly taken advantage of and pushed around because he doesn't know anything outside his little his little cubicle, you know. Uh, Aki is not that. We don't even, we know very little about him. And then Wild Grass arguably completes the process. It's just, it doesn't even have a protagonist, a firm, there isn't a protagonist. Any protagonist you have is the person actually reading the book, right? And that's an extremely innovative way to go about it. And after that, most of the rest of his his writings are what we call zawen, which are sort of like, I guess you can think of them as early blogs. I think, I Real think short. Essay, essay would be. Well, except that a lot of them don't qualify as essays or way too short. 
They're like you three paragraphs long, short. four paragraphs. You but I'm saying it, it's, it's, it's Dawen is not Sanwen. There's two different terms. Sanwen is sort of thought of as essay. Dawen is sort of like miscellany, you know, anyway. Sure. Um, so yeah, like I say, I have no problem with Dingling, but Lu Xun gets my vote for the twenties because this, this narrative, this, this biographical period of a scholar going from believing wholeheartedly in the reformative power of literature to literature can't do anything but express how lost we already are to, hey, let's give socialism a real shot. It's almost schizophrenic. And yet in some ways, if you're really deeply committed to truth in what you're writing and you live an active political life, how else are you supposed to do it? You know, I mean, even Ding Ling, right? She, she, she doesn't go all over the map, but you, you'd have to be crazy to go through what she went through and not have serious problems with the way the Chinese Communist Party functions. Sure. And eventually she she becomes a sort of, I'm, I'm going to use the term stooge, mm. um, for the Communist Party. She writes a very boring, long novel on the collectivization efforts uh, in, in the north of China. I think mm. it wins second place uh, in the Stalin Prize oh my of 1951, which if you can't even win the first Stalin place... The Stalin Prize, then yeah. If you can't even win first place in the Stalin Prize for literature... Probably not awesome. I don't I don't know if it's better or worse to yeah. win second place. That's an place. example of how you can be a winner and a loser <laughs> at the same time. Um, but but I think that, that one of the interesting things about Ding Ling is she took this position on gender and she was physically quite punished for that and i think that manifests itself some in her her the the quality of her writing goes down uh, in the 1950s and 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 thereafter uh and i i think that calls to mind the question of you know i think dingling and we have one other writer in our in my uh 100 years of chinese literature who is a female um, and and there is this question of you know why aren't more women featured? And I think mm-hmm. one of the reasons why is because women who took a bold stand in Chinese literature oftentimes were physically and psychologically punished throughout Chinese history. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the reasons there it isn't as though there were no female poets. For example, in the Tang Dynasty, they're just not anthologized. Uh, mostly, yeah, yeah. Mostly, I mean, um, I mean, there's none, but yeah. I mean, yeah. Song Dynasty is famous for Li Qingzhao. Very true. We should do an episode. We on. absolutely should. But but when we when we do our three thousand years of Chinese literature, year by year, three thousand podcasts in a row, when we do that thing, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I think that's a good place to end. So. Dingling or Lu Xun, you know, Lu Xun is, is just such a fantastic figure that he can span two decades. Absolutely. So I'm glad I did it first, and yep. then you did it Second. this this decade. Dingling is is one of those figures who we need to know more about. Agreed. Um, yeah, I cool. think that's a good place to end it. All right, man. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.